Good evening, everyone. I'm, my name is Linda Hayward. I am chairman of the board at the Southwest Harbor Public Library. And I welcome you to this talk that I know is going to be fascinating, The Geology of Mount Desert Island with Dwayne and Ruth Braun, who are truly the experts. Just a few bits of business first. Um, this talk is being recorded. It will be available on YouTube in a few days. So you can, if you have anything that you missed, you can go back and watch it again. Um, library is now welcoming walk-ins. Yay, that's a big improvement for us. Um, but for the children's room, we still want appointments and to use the computers, you need an appointment. So just that's a little bit of business. Upcoming talks in two weeks, we will be welcoming John Anderson, the author of Born on the Wind, an epic story of his grandfather's maritime adventures that include romance with the Mount Desert Island lighthouse keeper's daughter. That should be fun. Um, also coming up is local author Rebecca Milliken talking about her new autobiographical book, Gaining Altitude, Retirement and Beyond. You can register for both of those on our website. And speaking of the website, it's a new website. It's really great. And it has a really nice donate button. So please support the library if you can, because um, although people like Ruth and Dwayne are nice enough to donate their time, we like to pay our staff and we like to pay the utility bill. And for that, we need your help. All right, questions. If you have questions during the event, um, you may use the Q&A button to type your question in. And E. Rich Reed, our director, will then present the questions at the end of the talk. We're not going to interrupt Dwayne and Ruth as they're talking. So for any of you who don't know Dwayne and Ruth yet, um, they are both, as they put it, semi-retired geology professors. Semi-retired because they still do talks like this and they teach at the Acadia Senior College. They're still doing research. They have written a book about the geology of Mount Desert Island, which is available for purchase at the library. And now they're working on the geology of the Skudik Peninsula so that that can go in the next edition of the Mount Desert Island book. Um, they both taught at Bloomsburg College where a friend of mine took their course and found a lifelong career. So that tells you that they're really good teachers. Um, they had a hobby farm as they called it when they were living in Pennsylvania, 27 acres, two pigs, two to three beef cows and a big vegetable garden. They burned wood for heat and maintained a wood lot. They like hiking, hiking, camping and reading beside the wood stove. Um, I just think that they're gonna do a great job. I don't wanna take any more time, so take it away. Dwayne and Ruth. Okay, folks, uh, hopefully you can hear me out there. Uh, I seem to be unmuted. Uh, Ruth over here. Hi. Ruth. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's get moving here, folks. Our trip through time, geologic time, that is. So here we are flying over NDI, uh, about 20 miles up. This is what the present landscape looks like with the initials uh, for the individual towns around the island and there's Southwest Harbor down there. Now what we're going to do is uh, I will first uh, set the stage. Uh, where did NDI come from? Looking at global geology and mountain building tectonics. Then Ruth will uh, put MDI together itself, the rocks here in MDI. And then I'll come back and do the final, uh, like I say, their glacial sculpting. As note there, also many of the diagrams are in our book that we're using here, though we have other ones that uh, we don't use in the book. Okay, onward. Overall review of plate tectonics. So, the global mountain building process uh, it means that the continents are moving across the Earth's surface. 
and the ocean basins actually open and close over time. We're looking at a snapshot at 480 million years ago, the side view of things from the Earth's surface down into the mantle. We have two kinds of crust, relatively thick, lightweight crust under the continents or continental crust, and then much denser, much thinner crust under the ocean basins. And with convection going on in the mantle, cute arrows, that is dragging the plates at the surface of the Earth across the surface of the Earth. Most of it is sideways motion, but then when things collide, we crumple up a mountain range. 480 million years ago, North America had just been collided with, so to speak, this line of volcanoes and a microcontinent we call the Gander Terrain with MDI on its south side is heading for North America. And subduction is occurring pretty continuously and that's really the recycling process of what's going on. We generate new ocean crust and spreading ridges and get rid of the old ocean crust at subduction zones. Here's a cartoon of all the different kinds of plate boundaries. We were just talking about subduction here and a splitting zone or rift zone, spreading zone here out in the ocean. There's a global line of these or network of these across the earth. So that's where your new ocean crust is coming up, moves along and is subducted back down underneath the continent or underneath old ocean crust. Under a continent gives you a line of volcanic mountains like the Andes. Down under the ocean crust gives you a lines of volcanoes or volcanic arcs we see in the Western Pacific. In places the continents start breaking up and that's what we're seeing today in the East African Rift where the east part of Africa is splitting off of the rest of Africa. The main thing uh, to get from this is that over tens of hundreds of millions of years, ocean basins open and close, open and close. Continents, same time, are breaking apart and reassembling, breaking apart and reassembling. The big picture. Now let's take a look at North America. The old part of North America we geologists call Laurentia. It's one billion years old or older rock in that region of Canada and the interior of the United States. The red dashed line is the edge of North America 500 million years ago, and Maine did not exist at that time. So over a 120 million year period, what we call the Paleozoic era, different slices, different terrains are going to collide with North America to create Maine and other parts of the Southeastern United States. A little bit more detail here in New England. There is the old Laurentia there in pink, 500 million plus. Then the green zone comes in. That's that volcanic island arc that collides with North America 480 million years ago and deforms some of the old Laurentia. Then after that, so that makes northwesternmost Maine. And then the Gander Terrain comes in at 450 million years ago and collides with that in northwestern Maine and on down through Vermont. That's where the act of mountain building and volcanism was at that time. MDI was on what we call the trailing edge of that terrain or that plate, and we were not active at that point. Then Avalon, the Avalon slice, if you like, uh, comes in, collides with the Gander. And coincidentally, that boundary is parallel to the present coast here in down east of Maine and about 30 to 50 miles offshore. At that time, 20 million years ago, there was a line of eight volcanoes from Penobscot Bay up to Eastport. MDI was the largest one of that group. Then the Maguma train comes in, basically Nova Scotia at 370 million, and we have some more intrusions of igneous material in MDI. And then the rest of Gondwana, the southern continent, comes plowing in at 300 million to make the supercontinent Pangaea. Let's take a look at things through time, geologic time. 
We have four and a half billion years for the total length of geologic time. And the last half billion, then we usually split into three eras, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and then Cenozoic. And let's not worry about the period names at this point. So Gander, where MDI is, is attached to Gondwana and that part that is still now South America. And we're gonna break off of that in a bit. But first, Gander attached to Gondwana actually starts moving away from North America around 550 million years ago as an ocean basin we geologists call Iapetus opens. But then around 520 million years ago, Gander splits from the South American portion of, Pange of uh, Gondwana and starts moving towards North America, consuming that ocean. At 450 million years, again, Gander collides with North America. Then Avalon comes in at 420 when MDI is evolved, may, a volcano. 370, more intrusions of igneous material as Maguma comes in. And then Gondwana comes plowing in uh, to give us a few more intrusions offshore. 200 million years, Atlantic Ocean is in full breakup phase or opening phase, so to speak, and continues to open to the present time. And we'll finish off with a bit of global glaciation in the last couple of millions of years. That's going through time. Let's take a look at each of these times or some of these times paleogeographically, or what did the earth look like at those times? Here we are a billion years ago. There was a supercontinent at that time we geologists call Rodinia. And almost all the land masses were collected together. There's the South Pole here. The thing was concentrated at the equator, so to speak. Q for Quebec, part of Laurentia, old North America. G for Gander, sitting on part of Northern South America. Now, what's gonna happen is that over 450 million years, everything's gonna basically rotate down to center on the South Pole and start splitting apart. So moving up 450 million years, there we are now on the South Pole, the blue dot. And these red arrows are what's gonna happen during the Paleozoic era. Laurentia is gonna to head to the North and West, Baltica does a loop, and basically Gondwana rotates in position, stays near the South Pole. So there's a picture of 550 million years ago, opening up that ocean basin, the Iapetus Ocean. Okay, a little bit different picture here, moving up 50 million years to 500 million years ago, the Taconic volcanic chain or island arc is ready to collide with North America to form Northwestern Maine. Here's Laurentia, look at this, we're at the equator. Laurentia's at the equator. This is supposed to represent Greenland and Hudson's Bay today. And at the South Pole is Gondwana. And here is the Gander train with MDI starting to split off and move northward, heading for Laurentia and the equator. A little bit different view here. Here's the equator going through Laurentia. This is the island arc of the Taconics that has just plowed into North America. And now for a 30 million year period, Gander and MDI is gonna move northward and collide with the rest of North America to make Maine. Here we are at 420 million years ago when MDI was a super volcano. Avalon's plowing into us, subduction going on, a lot of materials getting melted in the collision zone and coming up as volcanic activity. Note that we're still hanging out at the equator at this time, tropical wet zone. Okay, here's MDI today. Ruth will pick up the story on the rock types of MDI itself. Ruth. Hello there. Are you ready to take a look at the rocks of MDI. We're going to start and I'll just give you a quick rundown of nine major units. Uh, the events that Duane talked about earlier um, are going to create these units. We've got the Ellsworth Schist on the west side of the island. On the east side of the island, we have the Bar Harbor Formation. Down here, we have one of the first um, injections 
we've got the Southwest Harbor granite, you've got the Cadillac Mountain granite, and you've got the Soamsville granite. So these, these are the major units that we're going to be looking at. If we want to put them on the same scale that Duane talked about as far as geologic time, somewhere around four, eight, excuse me, 500 million years ago, um, the Ellsworth schist is going to be metamorphosed. Now geologists can date igneous rocks and we can date metamorphic rocks, but we can't date sedimentary rocks. So when we give you a age for the Ellsworth schist, we're giving the age of metamorphism. It means that the sedimentary units that compose this material originally um, were laid down much younger. You're gonna have a period of uplift and erosion as Gander is moving away from South America and towards North America. Eventually we're going to erode these materials and we're going to lay down the Bar Harbor sediments. Um, about 465 million years. Um, they're gonna lay on top of these metamorphosed sediments. And then at 420 million years ago, Avalon is going to impinge on Gander and we're going to get a whole series of intrusions and extrusions. Duane mentioned before that somewhere around 370 to 380, Maguma comes in against Avalon and gives us a few younger injections on the island. From that point on, um, MDI isn't going to suffer too many injections. Um, we're going to have uplift and stream erosion until at the very end, 1.5, 2.5 million years ago, glaciers started down and the glaciers are going to do the final sculpting of the material. So let's take a look at these units. The Ellsworth schist, as I said, was found on the west side of the island. These were original clay, silt, um, volcanic ash and lava flows that were deposited along the trailing edge um, of Gander as it was moving towards North America. As Gander continues to move, the, the sediments that were shed off of Gander are going to be squeezed, they're going to be warmed up, they're going to be cooked, and they're going to become the Ellsworth schist. Again, they were, we can date the date of metamorphism, which was 500 to 510 million years ago. The sediments that made up these units had to be older. As this, as Gander is moving towards North America, it is going to start shedding sediments and these sediments are going to make up the Bar Harbor Formation. Again, the Bar Harbor Formation is sand, silt, clay, ash um, that were deposited over the Ellsworth Schist. Now, if you go to the shore path in Bar Harbor and walk along the shore path, you will see the Bar Harbor Formation you will notice that the rocks above the tide line have this reddish brown color. Many people think this is because it's a completely different kind of rock. You notice down here where the tide comes in and out, um, you've got your gray material. This is all gray material except where it's above the tide level. The iron in these units oxidize when they get in the air and if the tide doesn't wash the oxidation off, you get this brown coloration. So when you get the brown coloration of the Bar Harbor formation, it basically tells you it's above tide line. These were deposited somewhere around 465 million years ago. You look close at the Bar Harbor formation, they're layers, but these layers have not been contorted like the Ellsworth schist. They're also too smooth and, and consolidated to be real sedimentary layers. These have actually been cooked a little bit, squeezed a little bit. So technically they're not a sedimentary rock. They're also a metamorphic rock. So technically we don't have any sedimentary rocks on MDI. Okay, then as Avalon 
Dander has docked, okay, the trailing edge over here, you deposited the Ellsworth schist and then the Bar Harbor formation on top of it. Now at 420 million years ago, Avalon is going to move in. And as Avalon begins to create pressure here against Gander, you're going to start melting material and we're going to start having injections. And we have a whole series of injections. The first one will get, be a gabbro injection. Then the Southwest Harbor Granite and Tremont Felspar, Fell site intrusion. Associated with this is the Cranberry Island series. This is a whole 10,000 feet of lava and ash and pyroclastic flows. And it really tells us that the Southwest Harbor Granite was also a major volcano. The next intrusion that comes in is the Cadillac Mountain intrusion. It's the largest of all. Into the bottom of the magma chamber of the Cadillac Mountain Granite, there is going to be some gabbro and diorite injected. Now this material is much hotter. This comes from deeper in the mantle. It's hotter than the Cadillac Mountain Granite. It's gonna be injected into the bottom of this magma chamber. This magma chamber then will swell. It's under a lot of pressure, this extra heat that's coming in. And it's going to shatter and fracture the rocks above and around the volcano. There's going to be a catastrophic eruption. And that catastrophic eruption is going to create the shatter zone around the edge of the Cadillac Mountain granite. The last intrusion is the Somesville granite intrusion. It's the second largest. This will be the granite that you find at Hall Quarry. So let's take a look at these injections and see what they look like. Okay, the first injection was a gabbro intrusion. And this came in as dikes, okay? Dikes are vertical feeding tubes, so to speak. It's bringing magma up closer to the surface. Here, you're gonna cross the Ellsworth Schist and at the boundary line between the Bar Harbor and the Ellsworth Schist, these are gonna spread out into horizontal sills. Now, several of these dikes, other dikes continued upward and you had higher level sills that were within the Bar Harbor sediments. Several of these higher sills are what caps the Porcupine Islands that you see off of Bar Harbor. Gabbro is a very dark colored, um, very rich uh, in iron minerals. It comes from deeper in the crust. It's hotter, it's more dense. Um, so it's, it's quite characteristic. The next thing that's gonna happen is the collision continues. Uh, we're gonna start melting some continental crust and you're going to have the Southwest Harbor granite. This was a large, again, a large magma chamber. It used to take up most of the island. The Southwest Harbor granite is a light colored quartz and feldspar. The darker minerals that you see in here um, are usually biotite with a little bit of horn blend. Associated with that is a whole 10,000 feet of volcanic material that's found out here in the Cranberry Island volcanics. Originally, it was thought to be much younger than all of this, but uh, studies have shown um, mineralogy that these units out here in the volcanics are actually from the Southwest Harbor granite magma chamber from eruptions from that volcano. Um, up here, you see this is Mount Edna. It's actually active today in Italy. Um, these are shoots of ashes and pieces of magma and pieces of rock that have been torn up off um, the sides as these volcanoes erupt. They come up out of the volcano, they're heavy, they're dense, they sink down to the slopes of the volcano and come rushing down the volcano in pyroclastic flows. If you go down to the picnic area at Seawall, you will find some of these units that came down off the Southwest Harbor, we'll call it a volcano at this point, and um, came rushing down and solidified to form these pyroclastic um, rocks that we see there. 
So this tells us that at one point, um, the Southwest Harbor Granite Magma Chamber was feeding a surface volcano. These are cross sections. This is to give you an idea of what it would look like if you could pick up a piece of the crust and take a look at what was happening down below. Here is the Southwest Harbor Granite Magma Chamber. Here is the crater that it's erupting out of. Here is the Cranberry Island Volcanic Series that's laying on the flanks. Sometime after that, um, we're going to start a new intrusion, the Cadillac Mountain intrusion. The Cadillac Mountain is coarser grain. Right? In other words, it's larger and it's more reddish than the Southwest Harbor Granite. And the dark minerals that you see in here are hornblende. Hornblende is a very tough mineral and it makes this granite fairly hard to work. So again, we've got our cross section. Here's, <coughs> excuse me, the Cadillac Mountain granite magma chamber came up through, either pushed the Southwest Harbor granite up where it was eroded away or helped meld it through. It's also going to start having eruptions and coming out. Into the bottom of that magma chamber, we're going to inject now some gabbro and diorite. Remember gabbro and diorite are from deeper in the crust, they're hotter, they're denser. Um, they're going to have a hard time working their way up through the magma chamber. Geologists used to think that when you had two magmas, they basically mixed. They'd sort of meld into each other and you had a new type of granite. We now know that when you have two magmas that are different, um, you've got the gabbro magma, which is very hot, very dense. You've got the Cadillac Mountain um, magma, and this is much, much softer, or um, yeah, softer and uh, cooler, less dense. They don't mix, they mingle. Some of you have probably had experiences with lava lamps where you have these blobs of material that keep coming up out of the material and sort of spread out in horizontal layers. The same thing is happening to these two magmas. The dense gabbro magma um, can't really make its way up through the Cadillac mountain granite. It spreads out horizontally in these blobs. And this is what geologists call magma mingling. So here's our cross section again. Here again is the Cadillac Mountain granite. Um, sorry about that. Um, magma chamber. We're injecting this gabbro into the bottom of the chamber. It can't mix, it can't work its way up through, it spreads out horizontally but it is adding a tremendous amount of heat and pressure to the magma chamber. And that magma chamber swells and it fractures the rock around it, the cap rock, the cap around it. It fractures it, has a tremendous explosion, and that explosion is going to create the shatter zone that you see around the east and south part of the island. This shatter zone, one place that you can see it is at Sand Beach. If you go to Sand Beach and walk all the way to the east until you come to the rocky outcrops at the eastern edge, you will notice the rock mass that looks sort of strange. Um, you've got large pieces of sort of this reddish brown material. You've got other pieces of darker material and then you've got this light material in between. This light material in between is the Cadillac Mountain granite. These are large blocks of, in this case, this is the Bar Harbor formation. This is the surrounding rock. When the magma chamber swelled, it fractured this rock. After the catastrophic eruption, the magma chamber now is depressurized and these pieces are going to sink into the edge of the magma. These that you see, these brownish pieces here, brownish red, characteristic of the Bar Harbor formation, these are some of the older gabbro that were in the surrounding rock. And the lighter gray colored is the Cadillac Mountain granite. If you look close and see some of the larger pieces, some of the smaller pieces were actually completely 
um, incorporated into the granite, but the larger pieces get cooked on the outside. You've got the hot granite against the cold rock. It cooks into the rock. The cold rock is actually causing the granite right next to it to crystallize much faster. So you get a much finer, smaller crystal mass right around the block. So you have the zone around many of these blocks that you find in the magma. So we've had the injection, we've had the swelling, we've had a catastrophic eruption. That catastrophic eruption has fractured the rock. We've created a large caldera on the surface of the earth. One of the last things that are happening with this whole injection is that you get these dikes, these blue lines you see across the map. These are dikes that you can see, um, especially as you drive up Cadillac Mountain, you see these dikes. Originally, geologists felt that these dikes were much younger because we always thought that rocks had to be solid. Um, to allow them to fracture, to allow other materials to move up through them. We now know, thanks to laboratory techniques and experiments, that once a magma gets to about 50% crystallization, it's actually rigid enough that it can fracture and allow this material to come through. So these dikes now are just the late phase of the Cadillac Mountain intrusion. The last intrusion that comes in is the Somesville, which you find over here on, again, the western part of the island. The Somesville is a medium grain granite. It's not quite as large as a Cadillac, and it's a little bit larger than the Southwest Harbor. Um, you've got the this clear gray color, which is the quartz. The pink is potassium feldspar. And the black is biotite. Now, biotite is a much softer mineral than hornblende. And it makes this material much easier to work. And this is the material that was mined in Hall Quarry for many years um, as building blocks. So when we take a look at the Solmesville, again, we have an injection coming up through. Um, it probably never made it to the surface. We have no indication that the Southwest, that the Somesville granite made it to the surface, but it did push up a resurgent dome in the bottom of the caldera that was created by the explosive eruption of the Cadillac. Um, we have a little dome here. You notice we put a lake in here. Remember Duane said that at the time all this is taking place, all this material is at basically the equator, the equatorial wet zone. Anytime you have a depression in the surface of the earth down there, you're probably going to collect water. If we want to get an idea of what MDI looked like, we can take a look at some younger craters um, and calderas across the US today. Uh, you have a 0.76 million Long Valley caldera, the youngest one over here in California. You have two slightly older ones here in New Mexico. You have the Ossipee Ring Complex, which is 120 million years ago here in the White Mountains. But just remember, Cadillac is 420 million years old. So if we take a look at a cross section and what's going to happen uh, through time with these calderas, if you would look at a cross section of the Long Valley caldera right now, you're just beginning to erode these cap rocks, these rocks that were fractured by a catastrophic eruption and sank into the magma chamber. You're just beginning to erode them. Even the valves at, at 1.2 million years, again, you're just barely getting down in that cap rock. Even the emery at 35 million, Okay, you still, you've got a lot of cap rock below that. You're not in the magma chamber yet. The Ossipi at 120, okay, you're still not through the cap rock yet. The Cadillac at 420 million years, we removed, well, not we, but erosion 
<coughs> has removed all this material and what you're seeing now at the present ground surface is the deep magma chamber. Basically, um, erosion has removed two miles of rock um, from the original surface when Cadillac was actually a volcano. We can take a look at Long Valley Caldera today. You notice the very steep slopes around the side, the sort of flat bottom in the middle of the caldera, and it has a resurgent dome. Now, MDI is a little bit smaller, um, rounder, um, but if we take a look at this next picture, an actual aerial photograph, you can see the steep cliffs that would would have originally surrounded the caldera. You would have had a resurgent dome created by the Somesville intrusion. The main difference that you would see between this volcano caldera that we see today and MDI back 420 million years ago would be there'd be no trees. Um, land plants had just begun to colonize the surface of the earth. So you wouldn't have had uh, the trees, and you would probably have most of this area filled with water. Somewhere around 370 million years ago, about when Maguma came in against Avalon, um, there are three uh, younger intrusion. The Northeast Creek intrusion up here in the north part of the island, Baker Island, and Seawall Granite um, here in the southern part. The major MDI rock units are now in place. You've got the Ellsworth Schiss, the oldest one created as Gander moved forward, Bar Harbor that was deposited on top of it, all the igneous intrusions that took place when Avalon uh, collided with Gander. Now for the next 420 million years, we're gonna have erosion uh, remove a lot of this material. And Dwayne's gonna take over now. Mr. Erosion, yes, all right. So let's take a look at this side view again. So here is the present land surface. From Northwest to Southeast, we have Blue Hill Bay, the island itself, and then Frenchman's Bay, Somme Sound right there. Now we are deep in the magma chamber as Ruth emphasized, thanks to erosion cutting into things. Here's the old land surface. Also, the whole magma chamber has been tilted up markedly up on the northwest. So on the west side of the island, you're actually seeing the bottom of the magma chamber. On the east side of the island, you're seeing the lower side of the magma chamber with a little bit of that shatter zone. So most of this erosion though, nearly all of it, was done by streams over that long period of time. This is the present Smoky Mountains. This is what this area looked like for tens to hundreds of millions of years as the streams gradually carved into the rising ancestral Appalachian mountain range. Remember at 300 million Gondwana collides with North America to really complete the crumpling up of the Appalachian mountain chain at that time. It would have been a mountain chain much like at least the Rocky Mountains, if not the Himalayas. And then erosion is going to chew into that. And so for a long time, this ridge and ravine landscape, as you call it, V-shaped valleys and V-shaped ridges in between the V-shaped valleys was the landscape. No lakes, just streams sloping from the highlands to the lowlands. Now, as we approach the present time in the Cenozoic, the ruggedness of the mountain range would be greatly reduced by erosion until what you ended up just prior to glaciation that, you know, three or four or five million years ago was a low range of mountains of where MDI is today. And there would be a drainage divide from northeast to southwest across the crest of the range with shallow saddles in between the individual peaks. Streams would be draining south like Somme Stream. Uh, and then some streams would be draining north and swinging around to join the Union River on the west, going north to join the Skilling and Frenchman Rivers on the right. 
So this would be the landscape, a uh, range of oh, a couple thousand feet high, rising above a gently rolling landscape around it, all V-shaped stream valleys. And then the glaciers arrive. Now, first, let's do a little uh, work on what glaciers do and how they form and such. Simply, a glacier is an ice conveyor belt that's always moving. Whether the glacier's end or snout or terminus is stationary or going forward or going back. There's a game between accumulation of snow and ice and the loss of snow and ice. We geologists use the word ablation for all three ways of getting rid of ice. You can melt it to a liquid, but a lot of it is sublimated to a vapor like in Antarctica today. And then we have significant iceberg calving like in Greenland and parts of Antarctica today, and particularly on MDI. When the glacier was retreating through here, much of its loss was from iceberg calving. The key thing to remember, so when you have a balance between accumulation of snow and ice and it's melting, you have a balance that means that the ice is staying the same thickness and length and it's always flowing though. Even though the ice front is stationary at this balance between accumulation and ablation, the snout stays the same place. It melts away at the same place. Now, if you add some more extra snow, the ice can get thicker and longer and the snout will advance, the terminus will advance. You have a period that it gets warmer, then the ice will get thinner and shorter, i.e. it will retreat. Now, the glaciers are moving by both sliding on their base and internally deforming like a plastic. We can figure this out by drilling a series of holes in the glacier one summer, putting plastic pipes in them and coming back the next year and seeing the pipes have moved down glacier and they're all bent at the bottom. The distance between the holes is the, or where the hole originally was, is this basal slide. The bend of the pipe is the internal plastic flow. Now this plastic flow is occurring uh, whenever you have ice that is thicker than about 150 feet or 40 meters or so. The upper part of a glacier is a rigid solid with those cracks or crevasses in it that always pinch out below. But below that is the plastic always oozing, flowing at tens to hundreds of meters a year, we're usually talking about. Occasionally glaciers will move at thousands of meters a year, but let's not worry about that. And so just trying to give you a feeling for how glaciers work. Now let's move back to MDI. Here we are, 25,000 years ago, there's MDI, and the edge of the ice was out on George's Bank. Now all of North America was covered by a glacier and all that water came from the ocean. The ocean was 390 feet below present. George's Bank and the coast south of Long Island and all the way down the United States was dry land for a ways out shore to that depth, negative 390. Now, the ice front was on the north side of George's Bank the last time around, 25,000. And we are 200 miles from that edge of the ice with 5,000 feet of ice on top of it when the ice is, edge is here. Now, starting at 25,000, the ice is going to start retreating. And at 15,000, it's back on the island, just on the north side of the mountains. Now, the weight of all that ice pushed the crust down so that when the ice is back to MDI, sea level is 230 feet higher than present. Really, land is that much lower than present from the weight of the ice. Also, I should note out in the Gulf of Maine, there are huge basins deeply scoured out of the softer rocks by the glacier out in various places in the Gulf of Maine. The Maine coast is pretty unique in the United States because it is glacially scoured. The rest of the coast down along the southeastern United States is pretty much a beach. All right, let's move along. Now, this is just talking about the last glaciation. We now know that about five or more ice sheets have moved across MDI down to George's Bank in the last million years. This is information from areas I used to work in Pennsylvania and such off to the west and south. So if we got the Pennsylvania, it certainly got across MDI, let's put it that way. So we're looking at the composite effect or erosion of 
about five ice sheets, each one of them going over, flowing over MDI for something like 20 or 30,000 years. We're looking at about 100,000 years of ice erosion. Here we are at MDI, 1,500 years ago. We're just getting onto the south edge of the island. Uh, and the glacier is in the ocean. The land had been pressed down below sea level. The ice has been scraping away at the landscape. And individual hills, you are pushing on the north side of the hill, abrading it, grinding it. And on the south side, you're plucking off, ripping off blocks of rock as the ice continues flowing forward, giving you an asymmetric hill. The classic one is the beehive there above Sand Beach. Very gentle on the north slope, the compression slope, very steep on the tension slope or the plucked slope. But only a few of the peaks on MDI have this distinct shape. Most of the peaks actually are fairly symmetric. Now, big erosion features are the glacially deepened valleys. And what we have here in MDI is a hilly landscape a few hundred feet high, a few hundred feet underwater. And that's what we call a fjord. This is the landscape of Sweden, southern Sweden. And we have people come from Sweden and say, why, this is just like home. Now, if you have a mountainous landscape like in Norway, then you have thousands of feet up, thousands of feet underwater. Those are fjords. But sorry, folks, we have a fjord, not a fjord. Other shaped features, the streamlined hills, steeper on the south side, gentler on the north side. These are the porcupines out in Frenchman Bay. Though, honestly, the glacier just kind of accentuated the slope a little bit. These originally are what we call flat irons from stream erosion. There is a very hard gabbro layer here, gently dipping to the north, sloping to the north. And that hard rock is a cap rock. And when there are streams here, then that was a pointed hill in between two stream valleys. Another example of the great scour of the valleys. We don't think the mountaintops have been scoured down more than a few tens of yards couple hundred yards in the valleys, hundreds of feet of erosion in the valleys, going from a shallow V-shape to a deep U-shape. Minor features are polished instrations or scratches on the rock surface. Most of it's been weathered away on the mountaintops today. Here are some features still left on some of the mountaintops, Sargent and the Beehive. These are crescentic fractures, crescentic gouges, and rocks being pressed into the bedrock surface by the weight of the moving glacier, and then popping off and cracking the bedrock. Now, here is a map of the deposits left by the retreating glacier. Gray is basically just a little bit of stuff on top of bedrock, which is most of the island. Green areas are at least two meters, six feet of till on top of bedrock. The red lines are piles of debris that we call moraines left when the ice stabilizes during its retreat for a season or more. Uh, the purpley areas are marine mud. Remember the glacier has pushed down this area below the sea level at a time. So it's, there's ocean right in front of the glacier. And then some of the brown spots are beaches, high level beaches from the higher sea level. Now let's take a look at the northern end of the island where you see these really nice moraine ridges and such. Uh, but before we do that, let's look at another cartoon. This glacier is what we call a marine-based glacier as it retreats from this area. It's in the ocean and the ice is always flowing forward, but uh, it's being lost. The ice is being lost mainly by bergy bits or icebergs uh, cave, carving, uh, caving off the uh, calving off the glacier front. And uh, as the ice is retreating, it retreats mostly in the summer and then pushes back in the winter time. This is the picture right now. It's pushing back, building up this ridge in one winter. This was the previous winter moraine ridge. And this is the summer's retreat between this winter and the next winter. And those will be the red lines on the map that I was showing you before. Also, there's a lot of muddy water coming out from under the glacier, it's called rock flour or glacier milk. And that's forming the marine mud. Rocks in the marine mud are coming uh, from stuff melting out of the bottom of the icebergs and plopping down in the mud. So let's go back to the northern part of the island. And this is a LIDAR image, meaning that uh, 
It's an image of the bare ground. We have removed the data about vegetation and we just have the bare ground image. And you're seeing these individual lines, individual moraine ridges. They're like tree rings. They mark each winter's pause in the retreat of the glacier. In fact, it pushes back a little bit. We sometimes call them push moraines. But in between moraines is the summer melt, then the moraine, is, the moraine itself is the winter, then the next summer, and so on. They're a few hundred feet apart, only 10 or 15 feet high. They're very hard to see when you're standing on them out in the real landscape, particularly in the spruce forest. But the, basically, they're recording the annual retreat of the ice. I have mapped about 300 of them from here to the south side of the island. Now here is Maine overall, pushed down by the weight of the ice so that the sea floods right past MDI and all the way up to Bangor and all the way up actually to Medway. At 14,000 years ago, here we're at 15 and a half when the ice is at MDI and it rapidly melts to the north. But this whole region of central Maine and coastal Maine was under the sea for a few hundred years or more. Let's take a look at a graph of the elevation of the sea and relative to the land over time. Here is present sea level, up 200 feet, down 200 feet. And this is age at 16,000, the ice is just arriving near the island. And on 14,000 is up at Medway. But uh, let's take a look at this change in sea level. 230 feet above present sea level is a big uh, Jordan Pond Delta into the ocean. And uh, that sea level is then going to drop very rapidly. As I say over here, 10 to 15 feet per 100 years. In your lifetime, you would see the sea level drop markedly if you lived at that time. By 13,000, the sea is at the present level and rapidly dropping to negative 190 at 12,300. It's going to rapidly rise for a few hundred years, a uh, thousand years or so, and then level off a bit and then rise a bit, and then really slowly rise only 10 feet in the last 4,000 years, or one tide cycle. The way I think about it, 4,000 years ago, the present low tide line was the high tide line of 4,000 4, years ago. Of course, with all the uh, global warming routine, we uh, geologists that specialize in glaciers fully expect the sea to be at least 10 feet higher in 300 years, probably 20 feet higher in 300 years. Map view wise, so here's the island, nine separate islands. When the glacier just retreated from the area, it would sea level 230 feet higher than present, at about 15,000. And then sea level is going to rapidly drop, i.e. the land is going to rapidly rebound, as we say, out of the sea. And so then at 12.3, we have just sea level down here, a little bit of an embayment between Otter Point and uh, Scudic. Another little narrow embayment coming up between Swans and uh, Placentia. Now, in the bays, they were deeply scoured by the glacier. There were freshwater lakes for a few hundred to a few thousand years. The last, the longest lived one was in Soames Lake. And that was finally uh, broken into by the sea when sea levels around 30 or 40 feet below present in the last few thousand years. Okay, enough is enough. It's been an, almost an hour. This is the cover to our book if you want more details. Get the book, so to speak. And now it's time for questions. Let's see how this works. Here is. All right, great. Thank you so much for that fascinating history. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to um, feed them into the Q&A feature. You can also, if you wanna raise your hand and you wanna ask it in your own voice, we can, we can um, activate your mic. It says only 41%. And, um, so, so Dwayne, if, if somebody wanted to be a, oh, we've got a question here from, hold on one second. Here you go. Okay, so, so Tim, you're welcome to ask your question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. 
Thank you. This is this is wonderful. Um, I'm a geologist and picked up your book shortly after it was published and spent a wonderful uh, three or four days just uh, wandering around the island with the with a book in hand, looking at the good. field tripping. Good. Yes, absolutely. The question I had is is how different is is this interpretation of the Mount Desert uh, Island geology from the prior understanding? I understand there was a fairly <laughs> significant difference. difference. Can you right. comment uh, about that? Chapman's uh, work, uh, his book. Uh, Last one was published in 1970. His work really, the field work dated from the 50s. And uh, it wasn't until the 1990s that other additional work showed that this was a volcano. And so uh, that was actually a primary reason why we did the book is that the, uh, the existing one was so out of date that uh, we really had to get things uh, up to present, so to speak. But a lot of work from the 1990s into the 2000s uh, ver verified that this was a super volcano, so to speak. And so that's the big change. And of course, plate tectonics coming in, but the 1988 version has plate. Yeah, right. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great, all right, thank you. We have a question from Elizabeth Fox. Is pink granite to be found all over the island? inland as well on the coast? Yes, coastal Maine is characterized by pink granites, but uh, when you move up to the really big mass of granite in the uh, Lucerne Hills towards Bangor, that's all kind of a light gray granite. And most of the big granites off into western Maine and northern Maine are white. Uh, and that's one of these peculiar questions we don't, uh, we're arguing over still is why do we have so much pink granite on the coast? <laughs> Thank you. And um, so from Sue, we have is if Pangaea included all the known continents, was the whole rest of the globe ocean? Yes. When uh, we have a supercontinent Pangaea, we have essentially a global Pacific Ocean. Basically, what's been happening is that as Pangaea has broken up, the Atlantic opened, the Pacific is closing. And over the next 50 or 100 million years, we're going to close off the Pacific and just have a global Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and Sue also follows up asking, what is the name for the horizontal part of the dikes? Uh, SIL, S-I-L-L, SIL. And from Jeremy, if the plate for MDI floated up from the South Pole, do we share geological attributes with any areas in South America? I'm thinking about how the top of the Matterhorn shares geological substance with areas of Africa. Thank you. Well, since we've lost so much stuff from erosion, we got some problems with that, but uh, we do have uh, zircon evidence as we call it. Zircon is a mineral that can be recycled a number of times over geologic history. And the uh, zircon concentrations and types from uh, coastal Maine are similar to those in uh, present-day Venezuela. And, and we have um, Karen thanking you, saying that it's a new language for a non-geologist, but a good, yeah, for sure. <laughs> a great new way to look at what she hikes upon around MDI in the state. This has been greatly simplified from the, uh, <laughs> the detail story. <laughs> I, I just want to, do we have any more questions, E. Rich? Nope. Okay. I just want to say, I have heard this lecture, I think, three times, four times, at maybe, <laughs> at least. And it still blows my mind. It's still fascinating to me. Um, I've got the book. I look at that. I have a piece of Ellsworth schist in my front yard, and the thought that that is 500 million years old is really very cool. Um, so thank you so much, Dwayne and Ruth, for sharing thank this you. knowledge with us. Um, I know it takes a while to digest it, and I urge everyone who's attending today to come again if they do it again, because each time 
I've done it. I've picked up a little bit more and understood a little bit better what's going on. So I want to- In person, you. please, next time, hopefully. <laughs> so. And, and just one, one final question from um, Jeremy's son, Benjamin, who's nine. Yep. What is your favorite geological hike on the island? Favorite geological hike? Well, for straight geology, uh, the walk along the seawall area gets you a lot of really fundamental geology in the nice packet. Cross-cutting relationships, figuring out geologic age of things. That's a really great question. And um, maybe, maybe we could induce the bronze to make a guide for some geologic walks that they wouldn't have to be on with us and yet they could guide us through them. So something for them to do on a cold winter night or while they're out walking or whatever. Um, Erich, have I forgotten anything other than to remind people that we have programs upcoming and everything is on our wonderful new website? Nope, I think nope. And then otherwise just to follow, you know, just to remind everyone that within a day or two, a recording of this event will be on our YouTube um, channel, which you can link to from our website. So thank you. Well, thank you, Alrighty. everybody. Thank you to the bronze. Thank you, Erich. And I hope that soon we will be having our programs back in the library again. Indeed. Okay, see you around, folks. Night. Thank mm -hmm. you.